confronted by the thing we fear the most. We can only hope that someone will be there to help. For Kathleen, a 28-year-old real estate agent, that moment came on May 17th, 1990, at her home in Menlo Park, California. Apparently, the suspect in this case had been stalking this young woman for uh, up to eight years. She and the uh, man met in high school. They were classmates. They were never really friends or even acquaintances. Stalking. Sometimes it's to harm the person. Uh, sometimes it may be just because they're infatuated with the person. It's really a uh, scary crime because we often don't know the motive. At 4.57 p.m., a call came in to Menlo Park Police Dispatcher, Terry Rutledge. 911 emergency? Yes, uh, this is the city. My daughter, Kathleen, is at Fort... I think Larry, who has been harassing her, is in the house. Why do you think he's there? Uh, my wife just talked with her. And she said that he was there? Uh, she got that uh, impression. I'm not really sure. I wasn't on the phone. Is she home alone? I believe she is. Yes, your people patrol there all the time. They're very aware of this. Okay, we'll be right there. Thank you Thanks, very bye. much. Don't you welfare check suspicious circumstances? 19. All units in the area were immediately dispatched to the scene. Among those who responded was Terry's husband, Officer Lance Rutledge. Inside the residence, when we received the call, we knew that this was a potentially dangerous situation. I rolled that direction immediately, hell-bent for leather. I wanted to get there as quickly as possible. Kathleen's father also rushed toward her house, worried about what the stalker might do this time. I do remember just being almost paralyzed with fear. You get that taste in your mouth and that feeling of just utter helplessness. I was hoping, first of all, that there was some mistake, but uh, probably you could say I was hoping for the best, but certainly fearing the worst. Concerned about what might happen before officers could get to the scene, Terry called the house. I'm trying to confirm that. Hi, this is Terry calling from the police department. Yes. Is, uh, is he in the house with you? Uh -huh. Does he have any weapon? Yes. What does he have? Is it a gun? Uh-uh. A knife? Yeah. Okay. Is he in the very same room with yeah. you? We're here trying to get up there. Is it possible for you to pretend like I'm someone else and stay on the phone with me? Yeah, okay. Okay? So how are things going? Oh, pretty good. I don't know. You know, this house that I was thinking of um, showing you tomorrow, I don't know if it's right. It's a, it's a three-bedroom, two-bath, and it's um, about $350,000, but the lot's kind of small, so oh. I don't know. What do you think? And I was impressed that I don't think he could have possibly had an inkling of an idea that she was talking to the police department. They're uh, in the area. I'll let you know as soon as they get there. Okay. Okay? I don't know. I mean, it's, a, it's up to you if you want to see it maybe tomorrow. Ten for. What time do you want to do that? Oh, uh, probably. Well, what's yours? I don't have my appointment book with me. Okay. Well, uh, how about if I call you back? You okay. sure you want to hang up? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay, I have officers in the area, but they're not quite to your door yet. Okay. Okay, call me on call me on 911, all right? I remember at the end of the phone call just not wanting to let her go. I was so worried that something would happen to her. I felt like I was losing the only contact that we had to knowing whether she was okay and what was going on in the house. And it was, it was hard to just let it go and wait. Shortly after Terry hung up, Officer Jim Simpson got to the scene. We already knew he was armed with a knife. You don't know how volatile he's going to be. There's a possibility that he could have been armed with other weapons. So with that in mind, I approached the house from a silent approach so as not to alert anybody there as to my presence. Within moments, the house was surrounded. 
All areas that could be covered were covered. As soon as Police Chief Bruce Cumming arrived, he took command of the scene. The information that we had at that time was that the man was inside the house, and so was the victim. And they had not come out of the house yet, so we had a short time to begin to plan what we were going to do. Somebody's coming here. Oh, that's the father. Why don't you go talk to him? The first officer I encountered said, yes, your daughter uh, is inside, the uh, intruder is in there with her, and he's got a knife. Um, you hear that, and uh, you're, you just become almost uh, frozen with fear. We have officers all the way around the house, and we're going to find a way to get out of there. I couldn't see into the house. I had absolutely no idea what he was doing in that house with her. As far as I know, he could have been killing her right then, or he could have been sexually assaulting her, or any number of things. <laughs> Finally, I don't remember how long it was, probably an hour, an officer notified us via the radio that they were coming out. Come here. Stay here. Free! Police! Get your hands up! Kathy, over here! Run! Get your hands up! The next thing I saw was my daughter rounding the fence and running toward me. We just uh, grabbed each other, and the relief was just uh, indescribable. To run around the corner and see my father waiting there was great. And, you know, I felt safe, but at the same time saw how upset he was. And, you know, I, I felt more upset for him than me. He acted despondent, irrational. Finally pointed the gun to himself and said, hey. Go ahead and shoot me. I've lost everything I ever wanted. Go ahead and kill me. Don't do that to yourself. You don't rush an armed man with a gun. What our training tells is that you talk to him, talk to him, talk to him. That's the safest way to do it. Time's on our side, basically. We just wanted to wait him out. The standoff continued late into the night. Just before daybreak, members of the SWAT team were sent inside the house, led by Deputy Sheriff Warren Vanderside. The negotiators told us over the radio that the suspect wanted to come into the garage. They told him that they couldn't allow him to come in there with his gun. He'd have to put his gun down. Put it on the ground in front of the car. You're not going to hurt me? Not going to hurt you. Put the gun down. Just put the gun on the ground. After 12 hours, the ordeal had finally ended. Okay, okay. When this whole thing was over, I felt a great sense of relief. I felt a great sense of accomplishment. But the story is not over. The story continues. There is a good chance that he will try it again if he's been this obsessed in the past, that when he gets out of jail in six or seven years, that he may try and find her again. And that's very um, frightening. I don't believe the situation has been fixed. I don't think he's been fixed. He's going to come back. I feel he's going to come back. What's going to happen then? What are we going to have to do with him that time? It's been a year since the incident. And it's going back to Kathleen has gotten married and tried to go on with her life, but it hasn't been easy. I just am, am not the same person that I was before 1982. I look over my shoulder everywhere I go. I anticipate his arrival. Um, I feel like a prisoner in my own home. What I like. Talking about the stocking bill, helping it get into law, helps me cope. The man who stalked Kathleen pleaded guilty to four charges, but was sentenced to only eight years and eight months in prison. <laughs> Kathleen is now working with a California state senator to get laws passed across the country that would upgrade stalking to a felony. It was a very, very difficult thing to do, but it was a choice that I had to make because I want this person put away for as long as possible. This man is ruining my life, and I want him out of it. 
Kathleen's husband, Greg, is grateful to all those who answered her father's call for help that day. I'm glad that the Menlo Park Police Department was on top of things and was able to cut this off because it was, you know, she was ready to get in the car and he was ready to take her away and who knows what, what would have happened after that. And I, I don't even like to think about that. They probably saved my wife's life. So I'm, I'm very thankful every time I see her. I'm trying to live my life normally. I don't want to move. I don't want to change my identity. That's not right. I have a whole new outlook on life. Not a negative one. I have a very positive one. I mean, I know that my life will never be the same. But I know I'm going to be just fine. I think I know now more than ever that I'm going to be just fine.